Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. There was no telling what was going on in the back seat of the car that started down the country highway toward the village of Smoradina, but John fixed his gaze on the road. After all, it had been almost 24 hours without sleep, and he just had to be careful. Mars, ye wool, who's talking? the bad head Robert with all his bogater's practically strength. By the time he was 19, he was a two-meter tall brute pulling a bag of meat, not intending to seed it to a dog. Not because he was sorry. Robert was not the kind of man not to give his hungry little brother a treat. But simply the meat was bought not in a pet store, but in a supermarket for people, and accordingly, was generously salted, and even with pepper and other spices. In general, the dog was not allowed such a thing categorically. Why didn't you put a muzzle on him? Exclaimed the girl sitting next to me, trying to dodge this fiddling in the cramped space of the car interior. He drooled all my pants. Why didn't you come with us if you don't like dogs? Robert bellowed, you snowflake, who would marry you like that? And Mars, you also bite, give it back, yuck, yuck. Finally, the bag of meat was picked up and tucked deep into Robert's sweatshirt pocket. Are you offended? He turned to Emily's annoyed lips, which were tucked into her phone. But judging by the way she poked, holding back hysterical laughter, not offended at all. That's what the people said, John. Let's go over it again, point by point. Okay, we're going on vacation, while we clean up. Yeah, yeah, I remember, Emily rolled her eyes. You put the house on the market in the fall. The realtor has already found it, and he says that in this form the house will scare away all the buyers and reduce the value of the object. So instead of having a proper outdoor recuperation, we'll be bouncing around with paint and rakes for two whole months. I didn't miss anything. Oh, come on. Pushed her to the side, Robert, and winked through the rearview mirror. To the driver, he added, great. Let's have a good time. I personally have never been to the village in my life. I know it from my grandmother's stories. And I tell you, my friends, that we are in for a great adventure. John yawned widely and smiling, shook his head. His companions were as usual in their repertoire. And maybe it was the law of attraction of opposites that made them all so good together. They were nothing alike. And then, probably by the will of fate itself, they met one day and sitting down, intertwined exactly the threads of three Kolobox, unraveling everything in one basket. The village house they were traveling to once belonged to John's great-grandfather, then went to his great-grandparents, and from them already to his parents, who, breaking tradition, the land Pashu as the sphere of activity of the entire Melnikov family, became city dwellers. But then one day decided to return to the roots albeit not in the full sense of the expression. In general, John never seriously considered whether he loved his parents. Of course he did, as any normal child should love his mother and father if they were not, of course, quite egregious monsters and scoundrels. And John could not call his parents such, in spite of all their faults, the main of which was that at a certain age they decided to do away with bringing him up, living with him, and sent him out of sight. It was all about John being an unplanned child. He found this out at 17, about a month after his high school graduation, when his parents called him in for his first really serious conversation and to voice the decision they had made about his fate. Young John listened to it, and his cheeks flushed with a storm of your most diverse feelings of shame, anger, humiliation, and a sense of the unreal, the realness of what was happening. I didn't want to give birth, the mother said. I thought it was a purely female malfunction. I came out and missed my due date, the father added. Then, of course, we decided that we would raise you, since the higher powers had decided, my mother smiled, and John at this phrase almost physically felt that she was lying. No, he thought later, you might have loved me. Some parental instincts had come to light, I guess. But first they decided not to give her to the orphanage, because it would not get rid of the problems completely, but would only modify them. You'd have to pay child support, 
and also would be ashamed. Ashamed in front of people, relatives, colleagues, friends. But nothing of what the young man thought, did not say. He just listened. In general, in his 17 years John was very quiet, modest, and sullen. According to his peers and his teachers. Yes, he studied diligently, attended sports, even participated in amateur concerts, and also went to camp in the summer. But the boy lacked liveliness, or what? He lacked that direct lightness, which is inherent in all children and adorns the children's period of life, until the time when the guys are quite grown up. Believe me, you have never been a burden to us. The mother continued with feeling and took the father's hand, squeezed it, seeking support, and he nodded, believe me. You couldn't have dreamed of a better son. We didn't plan you, but we love you very much. But now you are a big son, and we are not young people. We want to live for ourselves. We're thinking of moving to the country. Father put in his word. A country house, our family house. We'll rent out the apartment and live there. Fresh air, farm products. That's the way it is. And you, by the way, will have a place to come for summer vacation. Summer vacation, John asked in a colorless voice. Naturally, nodded his father. You're a student. And by the way, I think it makes sense for you to apply to a neighboring city. They have a stronger faculty there. If, of course, you plan to seriously build a career, they live from paycheck to paycheck. Then the neighboring city. Can I get a specific name? And who am I going to live with there? In this, John believed his parents to send him to a different locality. Nothing would be under his hand, but sincerely caring for him. Because in foresight and the ability to make solid decisions, seriously reflecting themselves on studies and work, they were able to always and know that he wasn't a welcome child, whose arrival is a major miracle for parents, who is adored even before he is born. It basically wasn't such a great discovery for him. Because, yes, there had always been some estrangement between him and his parents, but it was strange, frightening, and surprising to John himself. But somehow this conversation didn't hurt him too much. It rather drew a line, clarified what had been generally clear before. But much later, looking back on his childhood, John realized that no, he would not have wished for other parents. Yes, perhaps it was not perfect with these ones, but they still cared for him, did not hurt him, did not reproach him in any way. And as he believed in his heart, they probably loved him with time. It was just that for some reason in their family, it was not customary to talk about such feelings in the open. But then it was too late. As soon as John turned 18, that is, this same year, in July, he left for a neighboring town. He was taken in by Aunt Camille, his father's cousin. She was a kind, cheerful woman. People around them usually say that they have a battery inside, that they are always glowing with positivity. Aunt Camille often came to visit, so John knew her well, and it didn't take long to get used to each other. Camille owned a posh three-bedroom apartment in a Stalinist era house. She also owned a small, but quite successful art gallery, inherited from her first and only now deceased husband. At the time of their wedding, by the way, they had a serious age difference of 32 years. But, as Camille herself said, they lived soul to soul, and she never remarried, choosing what to become in this life. By profession, John never doubted that he would be a translator. It just so happened that since childhood, foreign languages were given to him easily. He cracked knowledge as easily as peanuts. Studying in a university, of course, was a task not as simple as school time, but not badly given. In his native city, John, of course, remained all sorts of friends, acquaintances, but with them as quickly lost ties. The thing was that he was always a little aloof from other guys, which was largely explained by the fact that in school he was a typical nerd, and even a little behind the gang. No one let anyone cheat, told everyone that dabbled is stupid, and to study hard. Then by the age of 14, John changed the direction of behavior. But as they say, the moment at school was missed. Neighbors continued to consider him a weirdo and a shiv, but in a new place, he managed to start all over again. 
No, John still believed that studies came first. But he also began to realize that life does not consist of it alone. And he had made friends, the best of whom were now traveling with him to the village. Emily was the daughter of Camille's colleague. They are said to be good girls, almost to their 50th birthday. And they carry this characteristic with their heads held high, considering it as an amulet for all occasions of life, and in general a pass to a prosperous destiny. Emily dressed modestly, listened to classical music and maximum of Soviet pop songs, mockingly expressed if she was called to watch a Hollywood blockbuster, despised fast food, but did not attend fitness gyms, believed in one love for life and a bonus when going to the country, firmly stated that no, she would not bake potatoes in a fire with her boyfriends because that's how carcinogens are formed in them. And yet Camille went with John, and she volunteered herself because she was a loyal friend and wanted to support him morally. And Robert? Oh, Robert wasn't easy. They met when this kid, by the way, two years younger than John, he was 17 and Robert was 19, tried to steal his wallet at a bus stop, got caught and gave it back, asked him to let me go. Yeah, sure, said John threateningly at the time, holding the guy in a grapple. He was taking a self-defense class, so you can hurt anyone else. Are you a criminal? No, I'm a good person, Robert snorted stubbornly and resentfully. All around, people were stroking them, of course. And then suddenly it all came together. The fact that it was November outside, that the thief was already dressed in a common jacket, that he had circles under his eyes. And my stomach suddenly screamed. He let go of the guy and said, let's go and talk. The thief, rounding his eyes, but sensing that there would be no retribution right now. Then the floor followed. People at the bus stop gave the young men perplexed looks. John led the hapless thief to a coffee shop, ordered hamburgers, fries, more coffee, cinnamon buns, cheese pillows. What are you doing? The thief asked incredulously, but he wasn't drooling on the tray of food. And just now, what's your name? Robert, John, let's get acquainted. He held out his hand and the new acquaintance smiled shyly. Let's have a snack and then we'll talk. Coming and going. Robert nodded and unwrapped the hamburger, sinking his teeth into it, greedy and groaning with pleasure, with double cheese. I love cheese. It turned out that Robert's parents were missing. They didn't work, but they found money for alcohol. Robert wanted to work, tried it, but it didn't work out so well. He got a job at the market, selling shoes. His father stopped by. He wanted money. Robert refused saying he was sick of his parents' alcoholism and he wouldn't provide for them. So his father left with a couple boxes of shoes, and that's what Robert got. He was accused of stealing. Naturally, they didn't pay a penny. The owner of the shoe department made Robert work for free for four days and said in farewell that he had a lot of acquaintances and would arrange it so that the guy would never be hired anywhere in the city again. What's your plan? Asked John. Well, I saw an ad. They're inviting people to work in the region, Robert replied. They say you can earn 5,000 a day, or even 10. When you turn 18, I went straight away. No, John said seriously, it's a bait. At best they pay nothing, but they can also sell you into slavery, into slavery. Robert laughed, we are not in the Middle Ages, but then, when John explained to him how it was, he stopped laughing and blushed. Oh, Robert looked away. What am I supposed to do? I've only got nine grades of high school. Where will I go with them? Can I go to a vocational school? Said John. So I see you're confused, kid. Are you going to save me? Robert grinned bitterly. No, thanks for feeding me, of course. And for letting me go. But you can't go missing with me. I'm a soul. How can you be so sure? How else could you be? Robert shrugged. My father, my uncle, my mother and the rest of my family drank. My heredity was tainted. A man is the master of his own destiny, John said confidently. Let's be friends, Robert. For a while Robert looked suspiciously 
as if he might be bitten. He stared at the hand extended to him. Then he took a deep breath and blew his nose, and a firm, masculine handshake took place between two guys so different. That was four years ago, and since then Robert's life had been completely turned around. For one thing, John had the support of Aunt Camille, and though she was a man of no great sting, she dared to risk letting Robert stay with her. He was shocked by such generosity and behaved at first as if he had come to his personal kitten, except that he wasn't hiding behind the couch. It didn't take a psychic to realize. Robert had seen little good from those around him before, but despite his environment, in his childhood and adolescence, he had somehow managed to keep, as they say, a pure heart. He didn't spitefully beat himself up, didn't acquire bad habits. He wanted to be a normal person, to make his way to the best. It's just that until now, what's he doing running around in a vicious circle? Exactly. A donkey from ancient Rome who walked tied to a threshing machine, like grain in circles all day long. Robert was helped financially, bought him decent clothes and even the first smartphone in his life. It was obvious that he was not just fulfilling his duties, but even gladly helped around the house to wash the floor, run to the store, wash, and look all the things. Camille helped with employment. She had a mountain of acquaintances. Robert also went to vocational school. He decided to become an automobile mechanic. During all these years, John only twice came to his parents in the village, visited them for a week in the summer, and also visited them on New Year's Eve and on their birthdays. But he would leave quickly. He just felt that it was not necessary to drag it out with him because the parents themselves live a wonderful life. And then disaster struck, and they were killed in a car accident. And that's when John really realized how much he loved them, and how hard it was for him to realize that he was not the child they could love with all their hearts. But life went on, and it was decided to take a vacation in the village. The summer was unusually hot and sunny. And then sell the house. The apartment parents John also planned to sell, but later and was going to buy real estate for himself in the city where he lived with his grandfather Camille, where his life now flowed, especially since he had recently received a university diploma and therefore it was time to go and work. There was already a job waiting for him, as a translator from and into English, in a large trading firm. As for the Dogmars, he was not supposed to appear in a small company at all, but I did, joined just a couple weeks ago. It was a notable doggy in every way, its breed affiliation, a Robert defined as a groovy brute, Emily as an ugly flea, get away from me, and John as a cocker spaniel. He used to live across the street and was walked by an old lady named Adelaide. Then the old lady died, and her relatives, having hardly returned from the funeral, threw marks out on the stairwell. He, however, not understanding why, with him so longing for the disappeared mistress, howled in the entryway, which annoyed the neighbors. So he was put out on the street, and there he was found by Aunt Camille. In general, she did not keep pets, saying that her heart belonged only to the cat to the other, which lived still at her husband. But past Mar's auntie could not pass, and Castro of Adelaide's hairs, who must have been a fan from the other side of the world cursed for callousness. Camille brought the spaniel home, the duties of taking him to the vet for preventive care and buying him stuff at the pet store were left to Robert, who yes continued to live in their apartment. The reasoning was that the guy can't go back to his home, to his alcoholic parents. Renting a corner is an extra expense, and at the start of his young life, it's better to let him live where he lived before. But now Robert, by the way, could pay his share of the utility bills. How'd he start making money anyway? He was a generous guy. He always brought a cake for everyone or someone else. Flowers for Camille. Let the live animal hang in the fresh air, Camille said. So Mars went to the village. How beautiful, Robert exclaimed. When the car drove up the hill, from which they had a view of the village of Current, the expanse was indeed picturesque. There was a silvery ribbon of river, a ghostly mist floating over the flooded meadows, the clock showed barely five o'clock, and mooing was heard. 
delirium alive. There was a herd of cows in the village. The houses seemed tiny from here, somehow fabulously antique. Smoradina was not a crowded village, but it was a prosperous one. The locals had jobs in large agricultural holdings, and tourists often came here for ecotourism. Finally, the car reached the village and stopped at the gate of the right house. John got out to open it. Cool, said Robert, when the whole group was in the yard. If you're a fan of abandoned places, shook her head and wrinkled her nose Emily. I'm sorry, John. I don't want to say anything. Yeah, I know. Waved his hand at the guy. My parents wanted to live in the country, but had no idea how to do it right. The backyard was a sad sight to anyone with any understanding of village life. Shreveled out buildings, a fence overgrown with ivy instead of a vegetable garden, wild grasses. Already at the waist you were waving, there was a barrel lying decayed from time, which once held water. And it wasn't that it had been six months since the death of my parents, and there was no one to look after everything. It was just the way it was. And when John arrived, in fact, his parents kept the house more or less in order just to keep it level so it wouldn't fall apart. I don't understand, Emily said, why they didn't live in town. Did the mother's asthma get worse with age? John replied. The father took a remote job. They said he was drawn to his roots. But I agree with you. It's like living in the village, but we didn't become our own here. I wish I had a house and a farmstead, Robert said. I would have chickens in Russia, bought a cow and planted, a lot of big and black zucchini. Black are eggplants, Emily corrected him mockingly. Let them be eggplants, Robert smiled. The main thing is that it grows and bears fruit. Otherwise, you should be an agronomist. Do you want to work with machines yourself? Emily sighed. I want to earn a lot of money. I already know how to do it. It's like tuning cars to do. I'll collect cars for rich people and rise on it. And then, and maybe, and in fact, to farmers to fix. Maybe here, or maybe I'll go to Sicily and grow olives there. You were the only thing missing in Italy. Emily dipped back into her phone and walked through the house, barely looking under her feet. John and Robert started taking things out. Mars, clearly going crazy from the oxygen-rich air and the atmosphere of freedom. The suburban ran around in circles. A, hey, save me, help me. Suddenly, it sounded from the house, and the boys, throwing everything, rushed into the house. What happened? They exclaimed with glee. Emily stood on a stool. Her eyes were round, and there was terror in them. Her lips trembled. Her face was whiter than canvas there. She whispered and jabbed her finger somewhere on the floor. A mouse. There's no mouse. Robert squatted down, looking at the crevices in the floor. It's under the floor. The parents didn't seem to use it, John shrugged. What did they have to store in there? There was a refrigerator for groceries, drawers under the table for vegetables. I'm not staying in a house with a mouse, Emily exclaimed hysterically. How badly does it need you? Robert grinned. She's probably more scared of you than you are of her. So let's get our things and have a rest. Personally, I'm tired as a wolf. Hungry as a wolf, that's the correct way to say it, corrected John's friend. And the boys went back to work. The skewers were cookies and cakes, which Aunt Camille handed out for the road. Boil the kettle and sat at the table. Emily placed an overturned empty box beside it just in case and settled her feet on it. She dreaded the return of the formidable mouse. The dog was not left without food either. Several cans of canned food and a bag of dry food were taken for him. After eating, they began to decide where and who would sleep. Emily, when John conceded the parents' bedroom, he and Robert decided that they would sleep in the second room, which also served as a living room and kitchen. Wow, that's creepy, said Robert. The boy stood against the wall and looked at the painting. In general, parents did not bother with the furnishings of the house, being satisfied with little but there were a lot of paintings of reproductions of famous canvases, and all of them in one way or another reflected what John's parents lived. Their passion, which was, 
he suspected even deeper and stronger than the love that had made them marry. They had met through the fact that they had common interests. His father was then a university professor and was known as a ruthless, but also immensely talented history teacher. Her mother was an art historian, who had just gotten her degree, and was eager to work with something beautiful. By the way, Camille's aunt had told John that if she had not been friends with his mother on the basis of similarity of occupation, because Camille was an art dealer, then probably his parents would not have sent John to her. And so they believed that not only a relative, but also an intelligent person, and therefore can be trusted. John, by the way, did not agree with this very much. He believed that anyone, regardless of what they did in life, could be good or bad. Yeah, I agree. So-so supported his friend John, looking at the painting. I think it was some Scottish painter from the middle of the 18th century. The painting depicted an underwater world, like a lake among swarms of fish and seaweed. Carried along its bottom was Kelly the mythical horse, essentially a demon. Legend said that Kelly sometimes come ashore and wait there for daredevils, who, deciding that the horse is derelict, can become they try to put a bridle on him or even sit on his back. Legend said that then Keller would throw himself to the lake, and even the most skillful and brave rider couldn't stop him. The demonic horse would dive into the water and carry the man to the very bottom, where he would naturally die. But this was not the end. Legend said that such a poor drowning becomes an eternal servant of the water elves. That's exactly what the hapless horse lover was depicted in the painting. He was pulling his hands up in terror, but he was already united and even greenish in color. Robert, in general, knew what John's parents were doing, but now he suddenly felt it necessary to explain something else to him. And my father decided that it was better for my mother not to work at all, not to waste her health, and she sort of became a housewife. Not really. Anyway, my father gave up teaching just to move to the countryside. He started writing books on history, in magazines, articles, tutors. He also worked remotely. Can you imagine when I said I wanted to study a foreign language? My father thought it meant I'd join the family and help him with his research. And when he found out that I just wanted to work anywhere but in this whole cultural history thing, we had a fight. I see Robert stretched out, looking at the next painting. There's an inquisitor burning a witch at the stake. What kind of research did your father do? Was he looking for pirate's treasure? No, John smiled. He said treasure was a myth, and real historians should dig deeper. Where? I have no idea, John shrugged. We hadn't talked much the last few years. My parents were doing something like studying local history. Well, about how people settled this region, about how the first settlements came to be here. I didn't get into it. And the boys. Emily distracted them. It's the neighbors. What do you want? Robert stretched his neck, looking out of the window into the yard. Let the landlord handle it. Emily nodded at John. A whole miniature delegation of neighbors came. First of all, it was Grandpa James, the old timer, who in other times would have been appointed headman of the whole current. What rounded his eyes when he heard the price for which John planned to sell a house with the plot? No one would buy it for that kind of money. Is that it, boy? I know your parents, so I'm gonna give you some advice. Grandpa called your fingers. You wouldn't learn. You'd give in neighborly, humanly. My nephew would have bought the house, but for half the price. So John politely said it was impossible because the realtor did a preliminary appraisal. Your realtor's a fool spit Grandpa James to the side and left. Costia at the mercy of unconscious, money-hungry young people. In addition, Nancy's grandmother, about 70 years old, came in. She was strong in the face, however, and offered to buy milk, cottage cheese, and other things from her, as well as eggs, chickens, sauerkraut, ski, I'll make a daughter, he winked, and the field. Otherwise, it's scary to look at them. So, how am I not skinny? Indignant Emily, who generally accustomed everywhere and everywhere to tell the truth and what she thought. For what, by the way, has repeatedly run into various problems. I'm just watching my figure. I'll come back for milk from the evening milking. 
John agreed. Thank you very much. Another man, Kevin, came to talk, who worked in agricultural holdings as a tractor driver and offered the same services to neighbors No, Thank you. It's too late for plowing. Next year there will be other owners, John said, but I'll recommend you to them as the best specialist. Then it was Kevin who stepped closer and handed John 5,000. What's this? He didn't understand. Your parents came to me. A down payment for a vegetable garden outbreak. No. Kevin hesitated and glanced at Emily and Robert, as if unsure if it was okay to talk in front of them. But then he went on. He said that John's parents wanted Kevin and his car to go to the woods with them in the fall. Why? Had John stopped understanding anything at all? I don't know. Kevin waved his hands. They said there was some clearing to be done. Maybe building what they wanted in the woods. But why, I know. I just don't have to. So I'm returning it. All right. I'm out of here. Call me if you need anything. After putting the money in his pocket, John called his friends back to the house. He had to get settled in the new place. Plus, they had to check what was wrong with the wiring, because the light bulbs were suspicious and they had to run to the store to fill the refrigerator. All in all, there was a lot to do. You, how can you use that? Emily mockingly hid her lips as Robert and John almost taught pleasure. We sampled the milk from the evening milking, unpasteurized. Do you know what you can get from that? I do, Robert replied, wiping his milk mustache with the palm of his hand. Strong immunity. I'm sure you won't. Mars likes it. He nodded at the dog, who was crying from his bowl. At last everyone went to bed. John knew that old houses like this one were capable of making different sounds. The creaking on the knocking of it did not. After all, everything here is made of wood, which is what deteriorates over time. Yes also, of course, could rustle mice or even rats. But still in the silence of the night he was prevented from sleeping by some strange sounds. Robert was lying on the sofa against the wall, and John was on the cot. He turned on his other side, and thought about plugging his ears so he could fall asleep. But then he realized that the sounds were, first of all, coming from downstairs, and secondly, they were very suspicious. John licked nervously. If he were a person of a more fragile nervous system and a more vivid imagination, he would have thought it was a ghost moaning softly. Robert, are you asleep? He called softly. I am. The friend answered. Are you asleep? No, you should be. I'm tired. Tomorrow I have to go swimming at the river. Then in the afternoon, if I don't get enough sleep. Robert, what do you want? The friend replied already visibly irritated. Listen, but be a man, I'm tired. You listen, and I'm listening to you. The boy replied grimly. No, you hear that noise downstairs. For a few minutes the boys were quiet. They were both trying to make sense of the strange sound. You said your parents didn't use the cellar, and it's empty. I think it is. Then what's making the noise? I don't know. Let's check it out. The boys sat on their beds at the same time and stared at each other with round eyes. It was night, but the milky white light of the moon and the silver light of the stars poured into the room, giving the ordinary village atmosphere a certain disturbing mystical tinge. Emily didn't need to be awakened. Robert was already pulling off his jeans. She's a girl. Besides, if there's something really wrong, she won't be much use. What do you mean? What's wrong? John asked, are there zombies wandering around? His friend said with a serious face. And then he said quietly, oh, come on, you're watching your horror movies. And then the city of whatever. Horror movies are good for the body. Who said that? British scientists. They show us how to act in dangerous situations, prepare our nervous system for the trials. Do zombies or fighting vampires often help you? Robert did not answer only smiled enigmatically. Finally, they found a flashlight from the throne halves and stared at the cellar lid. You're the master, you're the first to go, Robert said, making an inviting gesture with his hand. If you get eaten up in there, don't worry. I'll be there for you, said John, 
making an inviting gesture with his hand. The lid was locked with a small lock. It had to be picked with some iron. The lid gave in reluctantly with a heavy creak. But Emily in the next room didn't wake up. Only suddenly she wanted to tell a story. She looked away with her eyes. Robert snores like a man, and all of herself such a fragile fairy. John went downstairs and stared suspiciously at the wooden staircase leading down. Then he cautiously began to descend. Finally his feet touched the floor. What was there shining from above Robert? Hey, why don't you say something? John was at a loss for words. The cellar was not so small under the floor, but rather a full basement, and what John was expecting to see here actually. But shelves, racks where the previous owners had stored supplies, maybe a pile of junk. But what he saw coming down hard from the basement, he you should see it for yourself. Yeah, Robert came in, walking heavy. He weighed a lot, and finally he was downstairs too. The first thing that caught his eye were the bookcases. Yes, it was a strange place to have chosen for them. But the fact was this. Four cabinets full of books were discovered in the basement, and by the looks of it, it was an antique. Back in the basement, it was clearly being renovated, and not for zero dollars and three cents. The floor was concrete here. The walls were leveled and painted. John pointed out the ventilation system to his friend. This place had clearly been done to perfection. There was also a massive table here, piled again with books and maps, also ancient looking, as well as newer ones that were all scribbled with felt tip pens and felt tip pens. In the corner of the basement, Gromov made some equipment, the purpose of which the guys did not even understand, but assumed that it was something digital and complex. It was one of the devices, resembling a metal detector, that emitted the very sound that had initially attracted John's attention. The guy randomly poked at the digital control panel, and the sound disappeared. It must have turned itself on. Maybe that's what happens to complicated machinery, he muttered thoughtfully. But the main thing that caught his eye, and made him wonder anxiously about the purpose of this place were two things. First, the cage was about a meter and a half high, three meters long, and two meters wide. It was made of thick iron bars covered with rust, and there were three locks on the door. One of the iron was brand new. The second was silver in color, and the third shone as if it were made of pure gold. And next to the cage were chains, barely as thick as my arm, and several massive steel collars. John, why? What's that for? Asked Robert, who was no longer smiling or joking. I don't know. The guy shook his head. He had just picked up a hardcover notebook from the table. It didn't look old. And when he opened it, he saw the dates and realized it was a diary. He also recognized his father's handwriting. I'm out of here, Robert said, and started climbing up the stairs. Yes, let's go in the morning. John swallowed the end of the phrase, what in the morning we'll figure out. We'll think about what this is all about. Yeah, it was definitely something to think about. Boys, why so glum? Emily asked at breakfast. They sat at the table and ate pancakes that Robert had unexpectedly made for everyone. He knew how to cook. Camille had taught him. But because of his constant business, he didn't even do it very often. Yes, so Robert replied and glanced at his friend. Looks like John's parents were maniacs, a basement full of maniacal gadgets. Why is Emily frozen? She couldn't get a bite of her puffed pancake to her mouth. I don't think they were maniacs. John sighed. But in all the years I've lived with them, I've never noticed anything like that. And then no, it's just a cage and chains and old books. Where are the pictures of the victims or whatever it is that maniacs usually keep in their basements? Will someone please explain to me what's going on? The girl exclaimed. We'd better show you. The guys looked at each other. It was less scary to explore the cellar in the daylight, but still the little group felt uncomfortable and hurried upstairs. I think this might tell us all about it. Emily nodded at the journal she had found. Go on, read it. It wasn't like this at all. They planned to spend the day. The sun was shining outside the window, 
Summer 12 o'clock beckoned with heat, and there was going to be a miracle on the river. How nice and breezy. But all three of them simultaneously felt they would not be able to rest until everything was sorted out. The entries in the diary were sloppy, with some dates missing. In some places over the text with a pen were made some notes with colored pencils. But his father's handwriting was small, ornate, easy to read, and John began to read aloud. Sometimes he was silent, skimming the text to pick out the main points. Sometimes he returned to what he had already read, and he drove his finger over the terms, as if he were checking what was already revealed next. And gradually the picture of what John's parents had been doing lately, and why the contents of the cellar were so strange began to emerge before the little company. It happened that at some point John's father became interested in the works of a French historian named Charles Dubois, who, however, differed from most of his colleagues in that he belonged to those historians who held alternative views on many events and facts. His writings inspired Father John to look at the history of his native land in a different way, and somehow turning to the history of the earliest period of paganism, he saw in the local tales and legends parallels with the mythology of ancient Scotland and decided that perhaps the ancient people knew something. It also turned out that the idea of Father John fervently supported his wife, and so the two of them turned to the study of a local legend about a certain water monster Kona, who lived underwater, demanded sacrifices, and also guarded untold treasures. Historian and cultural historian. These are people educated and talented. The last years of their lives were devoted to the fact that they tried to find, learn and understand how this legend could be connected with reality. It was mentioned in the diary that John's father also consulted a zoologist, that is, a zoologist, in unofficial science, who believed in the existence of mythical creatures not yet known to mankind, including, for example, the same kepi as well as sasquatches, mothman, mermaids, and unicorns. Father John pulled out antique books, maps. He spent all his savings on it. After reading this, John sighed. Now it was clear why there was nothing in their bank accounts after his parents died. Although they had once said that thanks to their frugal network their son would one day inherit a substantial capital. However, it did not seem to matter at all against the background of their sudden and terrible loss. So I understand correctly that your father wanted to find that water horse and the treasure it holds. Is that a cage and chains down there for him? Why are there three locks, by the way? What, really? One gold one. In Scotland, they believed it was the only way to keep him on land and tame him. There was silence in the house for a few moments. It was only Mars, who suddenly liked the idea of biting the half of it, who spoke, or rather, grumbled quietly. Each of the little company was immersed in his own thoughts. It was probably best to forget all this. The first to break the silence was Emily. You can't bring back the past, and that's all. Well, throw out all the unnecessary and give the books to the library. No, Robert waved his head. You could sell them on the internet. Collectors would snap them up. Maybe even make one million. What do you think? He elbowed John in the side. I think I never really knew my parents. He grinned sadly. It turns out they were crazy, and I didn't even notice any signs. Why crazy? Robert objected. You know, don't be like that. It was the parents. Yeah, the picture of the world was different from what they were used to, but you know, at least they treated you well. Mine are kind of serious. They don't believe in mysticism, and this is what it's come to. Booze, huh? Have you tried to cure them? Emily asked me out of the blue. It was as if she hadn't spoken to Robert about it before. Do you think you can take them off like babies and take them to the hospital? Robert snapped at her, all of them. I told them I hated being their son. They don't listen. And you know what? You don't need any advice, okay? I've tried everything, and no. Drinking more, losing their humanity, it's their choice. That's it. Buddy's not simmering down here. So I gave him a pat on the shoulder. We've got it all figured out and more. While he's on a country vacation, we won't broach the subject. Agreed. And finally, everyone finished the basement theme, turning to today. We decided that there was nothing to be lost in its entirety. 
and so we went to the river. There Robert playfully tried to drag Emily into the water, and she squealed that he was ruining her new blouse. You're so boring, the boyfriend said, pulling sand out of his head because Emily had tipped it onto the shore. You'll never find a boyfriend for yourself like that. But tell me who on vacation in the country dresses like for university or office work. All miss, I'm the smartest and most decent. He joked and dodged an empty seashell thrown at him. I have my swimsuit with me, Emily said, and sundresses and shorts. Can't wait to see the prize, whistled Robert. Just dressed as usual this morning. I'll surprise you tomorrow, laughed Emily. In the evening, so as not to bother cooking, they sent Robert to Grandma Nancy's, from whom they purchased homemade sausages. There was also homemade bread and eggs for breakfast in the morning and everything else they could eat. Good living. Robert sighed enviously on his return. Granny runs everything. It was already known that Nancy's grandmother had a son and a daughter. The son lives in the city and the daughter in the village, in her mother's house with her husband and three children. And the whole family unanimously obeys Nancy, who, despite her age, does not complain in the least about her health and does not intend to share a grain of power with any of the family. The next morning, while the boys were preparing breakfast, Robert took up baking pancakes again and said that John must learn the recipe because that would surely win his future wife's heart through her stomach one day. Emily undertook to sort through the books from the cellar and the first few volumes raised new questions. Who is B? N? asked she. It says here that the books are from the personal library of one B and S, but your father's name was Alexander, right? Probably the previous owner, from whom the books were bought, John responded, after breakfast and examined the house and the farmstead. And John made notes in a notebook where and what should be fixed or redone, so that in the end, the property would be sold in a decent condition and potential buyers would not have a chance picked on everything in the world to drive the price down. The next few days passed surprisingly measured, calm, and even lazy. After the initial anxieties about the seller find had subsided, the little company discovered that village life was not as easy as it seemed. So was it not easy to get used to the quiet? No, naturally the village was full of noises of its own, but none of it compared to the noises of the city. And at night, at night you could listen to crickets and nightingales. Well, at any rate, Robert said it was the nightingales that were singing, and it had to be the nightingales, and he didn't know how to identify any other songbirds, and Emily timidly asked him to try a little. When Robert once again brought a jar of warm steaming milk from Nancy's grandmother, aren't you afraid? The boy grinned, filling the mug. Emily waved her head and grabbed the mug with both hands and even managed to drink, stood for a minute with her eyes crinkling, then cupped her lips and smiled. Delicious, she said, and John had to put Mars on a leash because the dog was always trying to run off somewhere out into the vast countryside. Mars, of course, the restriction of his rights, was not happy and expressed this discontent with complaints and sounds. One day John, once again coming to Nancy's grandmother for provisions, became an accidental witness of her conversation with a neighbor. Who can be trusted? Oh, what's going on? Nancy was emotionally indignant. You don't say, the neighbor spluttered. Charles spent his whole life collecting these books. The thieves had no heart at all. John in earshot, hearing that first and last name. Something about them, coupled with the mention of books, seemed vaguely familiar to him. Thieves, is there crime here? He asked. Of course there is, she sighed. We don't live on Mars after all. We seem to be peaceful, but things happen. Charles had his books stolen almost a year ago. We don't know who did it. Charles was our teacher. He taught math, history too, Nancy explained. He's retired now. He's an avid collector of old books, you know and someone had the nerve to insult an old man. It's just awful, John muttered, desperately hoping his cheeks and ears weren't flaming scarlet because he seemed to know exactly who had stolen Charles' property. 
He waited for Nancy to hand him the groceries he needed. Then he paid her off and almost ran. The milk, which he was afraid of spilling, prevented him from really running. He ran towards his house. My parents stole the books, blurted out John, barely getting out into the hay, and told his friends everything. What are we going to do? Asked Robert. Should we return the books? Emily said sternly. It's an obvious thing to do, John thought. But how to do it? Robert said simply. Drop it off at night along with a note in which to write a sincere apology. They might find us by our fingerprints, though. No one's gonna come looking for us. Why would the old man do that? Said Emily. Because the books were stolen, said Robert. So he said that we returned them. Confused in the flow of thoughts of the interlocutor Emily, and still emotionally said Robert, I think we'd better just go to him and personally hand over the books, suggested John. And everyone looked at him, as if he had no mind to explain the situation as it is. After all, I'm not personally responsible for my parents' actions, and you are not involved at all. Just my friends. Oh, okay. Perhaps this is really the most reasonable way out, agreed after some thought Emily. I'm in. Robert winked. But if anything, you mean that I have a passport and I can run to Mexico. Why Mexico? Emily frowned. Because they don't seem to extradite criminals from there, replied Robert with the most serious look. What makes you think that? The girl raised an eyebrow. I heard it in some action movies. You watch too much nonsense. To the circus on La Emily, I don't even read fiction. Why should I read fiction when I can read self-development? Let's go today, John interjected. I think the sooner we get this thing over with, the better. And everyone agreed. John went to Grandma Paula's house again, under the pretext that he wanted to learn something important from the antiquities collector, because his parents, as it turned out, also valued rare books. Asked Charles' address. It turned out that he does not live in W. Current, but in a neighboring village, which also bore the rather remarkable name Central Badgers, where badgers all sorts of other side badgers, for example. Curious. Robert asked, but no one gave him an answer. The whole group, including Mars, went to the Central Badgers. The thing was that the dog, it turned out, hated not only to sit on a leash, but also to be alone. When they left for the last time, went for a swim at the river, then on their return received an angry lecture from the neighbors that their beast was howling. So passionately, how pitiful it was. But it also interfered with the afternoon sleep of old people and children. Good afternoon, said John cheerfully, as the gate opened and the face of an old man with a white, neat Spanish beard and penetrating blue eyes with tight eyebrows appeared behind it. We'd like to see Charles, corrected him. For what, may I ask? Do you want tutoring before you go to college? No, I'm already in my senior year, smiled John. She nodded at Emily too. And he's going to live with a high school diploma. He finished about Robert, but that doesn't mean I'm worse or stupider. Whether in jest or for real, the latter stood up for his human value. You see, I'm Melnikov's son, I've heard about this misfortune," nodded Charles. I'm sorry. You see, it's hard to explain, but John drew more air into his chest, gathering his courage. I've come to return your books. They were stolen from your library. Charles stiffened, frozen, as if not believing the reality of the young man's words. Then his gaze changed from questioningly wary to astonished, and finally it warmed. Come in, of course. Charles from the Coupe de Grace and the little company entered the courtyard. Don't be alarmed, Charles said, when a huge, nearly bear-sized dog's face emerged from the booth, and then an equally impressive-sized dog body appeared. That's me. She's completely harmless. It's just that she seems to be interested in yours. What is the name of the marvelous creature? Charles asked, leaning toward Mars and stroking his head boldly. After calling the Spaniel's name, John watched with interest as Mars squealed and tore himself from the leash, clearly eager to meet the selfies, which also commanded a tail. You keep him out. Charles wagged his finger at the guests. 
she's going through, pardon the physiological details, she's going through a phase where she's about to become a mother, you see. Are you planning on going again, daughter? Perhaps someone you know would like to have one. No, John said, and for some reason he blushed. I don't want to be the owner of a merry bunch either, Charles smiled. So let us all, not excluding Mars, come into the house. Alive, as you can see, alone, said Charles as they entered the house. Inside it was simple, but very clean and even cozy. There were flowers in pots on the windows and a real samover. I was just about to have tea, Charles said. So, young people, please come to the table. And we didn't come empty-handed. Go ahead, Robert. Let's have tea with this, shall we? He said, handing Charles a box of chocolates. They chose the most expensive and ornate of all those sold in the village store. At first they just drank a cup of tea, sampled the candy, and talked about village life. Then without haste, and with evident pleasure Charles examined all the books that had been returned to him. He stroked the spines and pages, shook his head, and chuckled softly. Thank you very much. You are a nice young man. I'm really sorry I didn't say more, Charles exclaimed. It's rather my own fault. You see, your father came to see me once. He was looking for help in a delicate matter. And I suppose you already know what it is, since you found out about the missing books. Yes, John nodded. My parents searched. They believed in all those myths. I didn't believe his suggestion that we find a campsite. Charles smiled sadly. And I have to admit, I'm still ashamed of my callousness. I should have realized how important it was for him to have access to those books as a historian, even if I didn't believe it. I literally had a fight with your father. And for that, I truly apologize from the bottom of my heart. I called him a gullible fool and told him his scheme was a disgrace to the historical profession. How wrong I was. You say you were wrong, but why? Asked Emily. Did you now believe W? No, dear girl, smiled Charles. But what should I have lent my books? Was your father a good man? John. He would have returned them. As it was, I pushed him into the crime myself. You see, I didn't want to share the books because, you see, it hurt my professional pride, and he had to go along with it. When I went to town, I have a son living there, I went to visit. You asked me if I believed in Kendall. Charles poured everyone another cup of tea from the samovar. Sadly, no. Belief in such miracles, you may agree, could make everyday life a little brighter. But I believe that almost every legend has some truth in it. In the sense that stories and legends and many fairy tales are almost always rooted in something real, even if they are presented to people in a highly altered, distorted form. He and Charles talked a little more about everything, and then they all went back. Current. At the village rest. A few more days and youth flew by. Behind the fence stood Grandpa James and waved, attracting the attention of those who went out into the yard. The old man looked worried. Have you seen our tractor driver? No, he hasn't, Robert answered. What happened? He asked. He's missing. What do you mean, missing? Asked Emily. In her hands the girl was holding a broom, in which courageously, though from the last nervous strength, she was collecting cobwebs from under the windows of the house. How should I know? James waved his hands. He had to go to work today, you know. And just like yesterday, he drove his tractor into the woods. So he disappeared on the way. He drove off, and he must have swerved. How's that? Robert was surprised. If the tractor goes anywhere, it won't be noticeable. It would leave a trail like an elephant. Kevin, I will not take the wheelchair through the field. He's a skillful fellow, Grandpa James declared with a thumbs up. How do I know? How did it happen? Maybe Leshy taught him how to cover his tracks and confuse them. Don't listen to him, said a woman in her forties who came to the fence. We think Kevin left his tractor somewhere in the woods. We just haven't gotten around to it yet. He just said he had some important business in the woods. So he probably has nowhere else to be. We figure if we can't find him by tonight, we'll call a rescue team. Rescue squad it is. And since he went missing last night, 
It's time to call it in, Emily said. I don't know what could have happened to him in the woods, guys. She turned to her neighbors in the village rest. Let's help. Well, we can, nodded John. But however, he did not consider it of a good idea. First of all, because he was seriously afraid that they might get lost. And then it would often be four people who would have to be rescued from the forest captivity. Unless, of course, they're used to whining about anything. It's a city snowflake. Emily will not attract the wolves that will eat it. And secondly, although he realized that it is extremely cynical, but John did not understand why. In fact, they should look for the missing tractor driver. In fact, a stranger to them. Especially since there was someone else to do it. The villagers were gathering. And the rescuers were to join soon. But still John backed Emily and Robert in agreement. Let's give Mars some of this man's stuff to sniff and he'll find it. Suggested Robert. Mars doesn't look like a former search dog, objected John. He's more likely to be wooden or a former search dog without special training. Dogs can't do that. Too bad, said Robert disappointedly. Then I'll just now pack a backpack quickly and move out for. We left literally half an hour later. Grandpa James said that the villagers had decided to enter the forest from the outskirts of Rodinka, and so the small company, reasoning that there were enough people in that direction without them, decided to move into the forest from the river. The sun was high in the sky, and the friends figured that they could easily do, so to speak, their duty to search for the missing neighbor in a couple of hours, and then return home. They would have lunch and go about their business. It's beautiful. Robert exclaimed for the umpteenth time. I was smart to dress like that. It was hard not to agree with him. He had bought a light, but covering the maximum of the body, clothes, and even the cap had a special net to protect his head and neck from insects. John dressed more lightly and was now suffering from bites. And Emily in general went in shorts and now every minute complained about the universal injustice. You could have come back. Stay home at all. No, stubbornly declared the girl and once again with a quiet tone slapped himself on the leg, knocking down a mosquito. I have a cream, refreshing for the skin. I'll put it on later, it won't help, Robert said in a collector's tone. I told you to take mine, it's insect repellent. It stinks, who's going to smell you in the woods? And after another half an hour, when my feet began to itch unbearably, Emily finally agreed to use a special remedy. The friends walked through the forest, loudly shouting the name of the missing tractor driver. At first, they thought they heard the voices of other seekers. But then they determined that they had mistaken their own egos for them. The friends hoped not to stray too far from the edge of the forest. Who knows ten signs that you're lost? Robert asked after a while. I don't know. What are they? Asked John stopping and slumping against a tree. He pulled a bottle of water out of his backpack and gulped greedily. They must exist. But even without them, it's clear we're lost. Robert began. Yes, sorry they are. That was funny. Yes, it was. Emily frowned and looked around anxiously. We couldn't have gotten lost. Why not? John asked. Because we always stayed near the edge of the forest and even the field was visible through the trees. The girl answered without much confidence, and now it's all forest, Robert sighed. And this is the fourth time we've come back to this point with mushrooms. So there are exactly two facts. We are lost, we are walking in circles. For a few minutes, everyone was silent. But wait, John grabbed Emily by the arm. Where are you going? Strictly he asked the girl, who was breathing strangely, very hard and often, and her eyes were darting from side to side. Let me go, I can't stay here, I can't. She's panicking, Robert said knowingly. Slap her or pinch her harder and she'll come to her senses, ignoring such harsh advice. John just gently shook Emily by the shoulders and ordered her to look him in the eye. We're going to get out of here, calm down. It's not winter, and that means we're not freezing. We have water and food with us. We have half a bottle of water left on us at most. And Mars needs to be fed, Robert grumbled. But John gave him a scary look and went on. 
There's a bunch more villagers walking through the woods. Soon the rescuers will be here, so everything will be all right. Do you understand me? Can you hear me? Yes, answered Emily, who was finally able to calm down a little. Meanwhile, the sun was beginning to sink behind the treetops. Robert, praising himself for his foresight, fed Mars a couple of guests, grabbed some dry dog food, and poured the rest of his water into a bowl. Then he suggested we take a break. One could look at it all positively. With an uncertain smile, tried to cheer up the girl John. We're in for a real adventure. I don't suppose that's ever happened to you before, has it? Fortunately, I had a normal life before. Emily, on the other hand, had her nose perched on the trunk of a fallen tree. What are we gonna do? Sleep on the bare ground. There's plenty of conifers, John explained. If you don't break your legs, you can make a pretty good bed. But summer ones are warm and we'll make a fire, Robert said enthusiastically. We'll tell scary stories. Oh, Diz it is silent and please. I couldn't stand it, I shouted. And then Emily appeared. John shook his head reproachfully and asked Robert to be tactful. The man spread his hands but was quickly distracted. There were pressing matters to attend to. A fire had to be built and the aforementioned Labnik had to be brought in. Soon it became completely dark and everyone moved closer to the fire. The warm amber scarlet light was soothing and made them feel safe. Are there any wolves around here? Emily asked. No, it's been over 70 years since they were exterminated, said John. Sorry, I should have insisted we didn't go anywhere. It's not a vacation in the countryside. It's a bit of a mess. It's all right, we'll get over it, Robert smiled. Soon everyone, and even Bodrov. It seemed that 24 o'clock in a day Mars began to fall asleep, but barely rested on his paws, barely closed his eyes and relaxed. All three of them caught a glimpse of sounds coming from somewhere deep in the forest. Mars woke up too, raised his ears wary. What is it? Emily asked. And then suddenly she was beside Robert, as if his closer presence could protect her. It sounded like banging on a rock, John suggested cautiously. He swiveled his head, but he couldn't figure out exactly where the sound was coming from. Maybe a moose sharpening its horns, Robert said. What did he add in response to his friend's stares? Well, or a lynx. The claws need to be looked at. John rose resolutely from his seat and picked up his lantern and picked up his backpack from the ground, for it held everything he had taken on this unexpectedly long hike, and he didn't know what of it might end up being useful. I'm not going anywhere. Emily ventured, looking anxiously at the fire. Unless we take a torch with us. I don't know how to make a torch, said John. We have flashlights. The three of us. It's just a forest that doesn't even have wolves in it. We should check to see if there's a man in trouble trying to attract attention. Or is the woodsman luring us into the thicket to kill us in the swamp? Robert added. But seeing how the faces of John's friends had changed, she turned reproachful and became, and at Emily's commanded, hastily apologized. Moving through the night forest, when all the lighting was weak, and not at all a tourist flashlight, yes, the rays of the moon checking through the thick branches, was. It was not an easy task, but somehow we didn't break our legs, we didn't collapse in hawthorn bushes, and only once Robert with curses flew into a thicket of nettles. And then all of a sudden, suddenly, everyone was out in the clearing. It seemed that some fairy giant had simply sickled giants with whom Toth had cut out a part of the forest, leaving an immaculately round ground on which to make a mountain of green stones, but not because they were some rare rock, but because they were all overgrown with moss. Cautiously warned Robert, almost flapping underfoot in places. That means we came into the swamp from this side of the forest. But here it's slowly beginning, I guess, and somewhere farther away it's a real swamp. We're moving this way, you know. This part of the clearing is dry. That's why the rocks are standing. They're underground. The sound stopped, John said, waving the flashlight from side to side. Hey, is anybody alive? And do you imagine you'll get an answer? And negative, Robert joked grimly. 
That's a weird question. Oh, shut up. Almost crying, Emily asked. I'll never go outdoors again in my life. I hate the forest. These prickles, insects, twigs. I want to go to the city, quietly whispered to his friends John. Do you hear that? They listened and indeed caught some sound, as if there was a rustling and a Smolensk mouse somewhere nearby. There are people here. The whole trio jumped when they heard a human voice. It sounded strange. The story seemed to come from under the ground. Where are you? Asked John, moving cautiously forward. And now shining a flashlight under his feet, a voice reported from below. Said, I think I broke my leg. Who are you? Asked John. Kevin, replied the voice. And you are the townspeople. Yes, they are. We are Zater. Robert echoed and rushed forward. In his panic, he inadvertently grabbed the flashlight he had taken from Emily. The tech was running, and the guy was trying to fix it somehow. Left unlit, the girl fearfully took a chance and skipped following. So I think I found it, reported John, stopping at the place where the rocks began. From the side, they looked like something familiar. And after a moment, John realized that it was like Stonehenge, except that the stones were smaller and more frequently spaced, so that there was little space between them. John moved very carefully, but his foot almost slipped into the black hole. There were also stones lying on the ground at this spot, but one flat one appeared to have been pushed to the side. Nearby lay the thing that had made it possible, a huge metal bar barely an arm's length thick. The flashlight beam slid down and snatched up a familiar face that reflected a renamed palette of emotions. It was indeed Kevin. It turned out that he had lowered himself down on a rope, but had tied it around one of the rocks insufficiently securely, as a result of which it had torn under his weight, and Kevin had collapsed down with an injured leg and no way to get out. The rope and his backpack were found nearby. But why did you come up here in the first place? Emily wondered. The whole village is looking for you. Do you know? It's a long story, replied the tractor driver. It seems that we have enough time to listen to it, said John, figuring out how to get the grief of speleologists outside. There was nothing suitable in the friend's backpacks, as it turned out. Kevin had another rope in his backpack, apparently a spare, but it seemed very thin and unreliable. But after thinking about it, John decided that if he screwed it in half, it might hold. And while he was doing that, Kevin spoke. He said he was just looking for something. Looking for what? Asked Emily, who could have sworn that Kevin wasn't telling the truth. Guys, it sounds like he was looking for the same thing your parents were looking for, Robert said. Yeah, I know. He waved his hand as two pairs of eyes turned to him. It wasn't good to poke around in other people's things, but he held up a hand that held a book similar to the ones John's parents kept in the basement, and tucked between the pages of the book was an antique map. It was unique to the backpack, Robert said. Did you guys go a little crazy too? Were you looking for a water horse? Robert turned to Kevin. No, he answered with a sigh. I was looking for gold. I've got a loan in the bank. My son's wife's nagging me. And by the way, I didn't steal those books. I just borrowed them. That is, if you follow the letter of the law, you took without asking, and in fact, still stole, summarized Emily. I'm sorry, Kevin said pitifully. When all this happened to my parents, I came to the wake, and I took it. Yes, I know, as a bastard did, but you're not gonna leave me here for that, are you? Get me out of here, please, save me. Of course we won't leave you, John replied and threw down a rope. Hold on tight there. Now we will lift a little, pull all three of us, and then grab my hand. It was clear here, Kevin, everything was clear, and soon all four of us would pull the load together. But he was pulled out. The tractor driver stretched out on the ground, and for a couple of minutes just tried to catch his breath. Then he got to his feet and immediately ducked his foot. It was okay to step on, but it hurt. So, you were looking for gold. What made you think that one? Robert asked. Sighing, Robert looked around at his friends and finally spoke. It turned out that John's father hadn't just asked him for help, 
He wanted to move these very stones in the forest, so he shared the content of the legends. Kevin, however, did not believe in the water horse, but decided that this fairy tale could be really connected with buried gold, and the water horse was invented by the people to scare away the hunters for riches. So Kevin decided that we can't wait any longer, we have to get the gold ourselves. Until the townspeople also studied the books and went to look for it. How? Is there anything down there? Asked John. No, Kevin shook his head. Just some old hardware, right? Robert rushed to the rocks, lay down on his belly, and shone his flashlight inside. The cavity, or rather, the hole, hidden for years under the stone, was small and perfectly visible. Earthen floors, walls through which tree roots had worked, some old iron on the floor and clay shards. Maybe, Robert suggested. There was some kind of burial ground or temple of antiquity here. I don't know. We'll figure it out later, John said. We have to get out of here on our own, he added. Gloomy, because you can't get cell phone reception in a place like this. Which way to go? Robert asked. That way, John answered confidently. That's where we came from. Yes, it's almost light. In fact, I think we'll be out of the forest soon. But in practice, it turned out that the forest seemed to be only further away, where the rescuers were grumbling. Emily, I'm tired. Only one Mars, it seems, felt excellent and cheerfully settled down next to me. And then the dog at some point became alert and pulled everyone to the side. John looked where the animal was leading and almost shouted with joy. There was a gap between the trees ahead, and that could only mean that they were finally out of the forest. Indeed, the forest soon turned gray, and a little company found themselves in a meadow that stretched as far as the eye could see. There were still some trees, but it looked more like a grove than a forest. But the main thing that caught the eye was the lake, shining with ghostly sparks in the light of the moon and the sky that had barely begun to lighten. Are there any lakes near current? Robert asked. There are, Kevin replied. The witches call them lakes. The fish bite well here. Why do witches call me? Robert asked. That's what they say. The tractor driver lowered his voice. The cursed ones only come here at daylight. What kind of nonsense is that? Exclaimed Emily, who had barely left the woods. The common ones are back. Her skepticism and intolerance if anyone was superstitious. You'll tell me it's a creature that lives here. What's his name? Emily took a few steps ahead of the men and stood in front of them with her hands at her sides. All right. Listen to me carefully, everyone. As soon as we get out of here, I'm going straight home. I've had enough adventures. Right. The wind's blowing. Too bad about the mice. A bird called out in a long, high-pitched squawk. As Robert Vodianova said, the horse's name is Kelly, and he's the one right behind you right now. Emily opened her mouth to answer Kolk and to whip that insufferably moo-type seagull who had recently caused in her such a storm of contradictory feelings. But she didn't make a sound because right now a sound came from behind her back. It was a heavy, thick, voluminous, horse-shaped horse. Emily turned very slowly toward the lake. There, on its opposite side, a black head had emerged from the bushes. A thick, wet mane fanned her and the horse's neck. Twigs and something green were tangled in the beer. It seemed that the eyes, black as a gates, barely distinguishable on the raven color of the creature, looked piercingly into the very souls of the people gathered on the shore. For a few moments that seemed like an eternity, the creature just stared at the people. And then Mars was angry with a piercing bark. It was as if the genetic memory of the ancestors had suddenly awakened in the small apiary. After all, Representatives of this breed were originally bred as hunting dogs. He fell down on his belly button and, sliding, grumbling at all odds, moved forward. Several ducks erupted from the nearest bushes, clearly frightened of such a formidable enemy, a mysterious creature. The black horse froze. He scrutinized the approaching dog, who, however, did not yet venture directly into the water. The canal creature again lingered loudly, shrilly, menacingly, and darted forward with powerful legs, 
knocking the water into the lake, raising a cloud of spray. The people on Bereshko screamed as if on cue and scurried away. Marx, apparently realizing that he had overdone the grumbling, also scurried away. Tell P, shouted Robert. Run for your lives. The tractor driver was running fast, despite his sore leg, and was already hiding behind the trees. John also rushed, but behind. Emily cried out. He turned around. The girl tripped and fell. And the water horse was already looming over her. Streams of water flowed from his magnificent watery hide, mane, and tail. The rising sun was reflected in the water, giving the illusion that the horse was shining as if studded with diamond dust. Stop, John exclaimed. Stand still, who did I tell you to stand still? He angrily called out to the men before they could get lost in the forest again. Emily, he approached the girl, who, lying on the grass, was curled up in a ball. The man covered her head and hard on the sobs of the oxen. It's just a horse, Emily. The animal meanwhile finally got out of the lake, which must have been because it was a hot summer and the water level had dropped. It reached his neck as the horse crossed it. The horse looked at the men with curiosity. He was not at all hostile and looked rather very interested. Why, that's it. That's not our animal. Kevin, who had returned, exclaimed. Oh, I remember. It's always dying. Servant, where all the cattle graze, clean and walk around in the middle of nowhere. Don't be afraid. The tractor driver turned to Emily, who finally got to her feet with John's support. Wet with dew, shivering, and still talking through his nose. He's docile, but he can bite. Don't be impatient, said Robert, who had also returned. And there was disappointment in the guy's voice. Okay, so everything's fine. And he's so handsome. I wish I had a horse. I'd drive it all over the world. That's what John said. Let's go back, shall we? But where to go? You're not lost now. Kevin waved his hand. Here it is. We'll go around the lake here, and then we'll come out of the mountains like currents. Let's go, shall we? The return of the lost tractor driver was greeted with great enthusiasm by the villagers. They had already had time and were about to call rescuers when they realized that they could not find the tractor driver themselves. It's all right. Kevin fought off the neighbor's questions. I got a little confused. Well, I'd had a few drinks, so he decided to take a ride on the tractor. Yeah, I remember where it's parked. What's all the noise? It's not going anywhere. Of course, nobody's driving it away. Who would steal it near the forest? Hares. It's all right, but I'm going to see a doctor. I hurt my leg. Robert, John and Emily looked at each other. It was clear that Kevin did not intend to share the story with anyone, and the hole he had found in the woods was under rocks. But so far it was unclear to them why he had kept quiet about it, unless it was because he was embarrassed that they would talk about him an unsuccessful treasure hunter who believed in gray tales. Finally, everyone returned home and slept the rest of the day because they were very tired. The friends woke up only to have a couple of snacks and, of course, to feed Mars. The next day, a realtor from the city unexpectedly came to the village. A real estate agency employee came to say that in principle, a house can be very much and not to repair because it has already found a buyer who, in fact, needs only a plot of land, and he would demolish the wooden house and build a brick one instead. John understood that in principle it was a normal, business-like offer and that he would have less worries. But at the same time, it gave him an unpleasant feeling in his heart. After all, it turned out that the farewell to the home of his parents, the home of grandparents, distant ancestors, it became closer and took on more real and harsh features. But the boy answered in agreement. I'm not a gardener myself anyway. Yes, and go far away. If just for a weekend vacation, he explained his decision to his friends. So I'm selling unequivocally. And what to do with all this? Asked Emily. You can't give the basement as a package. Of course not, agreed John. A couple of days later, he visited Kevin, who announced that his leg was almost completely fine. It was just a little sprain. Kevin agreed to help clear out the basement 
and soon showed up with all the necessary tools. The same cage needed to be sawed down so that it could be taken to the junkyard normally later. Castle Silver and Gold John decided to keep as a memory of his parents. He also decided to keep his father's diary and some books from their personal library. The rest of the volumes were photographed by friends and put on the internet for sale, but a few more books he decided to donate to the local village library. What are these? Robert asked. He had seen John wrap a few particularly ancient books in gift paper and tie them nicely with ribbon. He had bought both the day before at the local store. I think we should do some justice and pay one person a visit after all. John smiled. By the way, we saw Mars. I asked him to eat, but he wouldn't come. He seems to be running around somewhere, Robert said. It's not all the time for him to sit on a leash, right? Soon we went to the neighboring village to see Charles. Not empty-handed again. This time we took a cake. Which, by the way, in order not to spoil while walking in the hot weather, we put a cooler in the bag. Charles, fortunately, happened to be at home. He was surprised by the guests, but surprised pleasantly, and immediately went to put the samover on for a tea party. Mars, John marveled when suddenly the poster's face appeared from the box, followed by the spaniel. I was just about to take him to you, said Charles. He ran straight to my girl. I guess they're in love, but if they do breed, he'll be in good hands. Don't worry, I'll take full charge. Finally, we sat down at the table. Charles praised the cake and opened the present with a sigh of sympathy. You know, after your father came to see me, I went back to that conversation more than once, he said thoughtfully. And after your parents' accident. Anyway, I decided to do some serious research on the subject. Just a moment. With a warning thumbs up, the old man got up from the table and went into the next room, where something was rustling about. Here, he said, when he returned and gently set down on the table a book from his own collection. It looked as if it might crumble at the slightest touch, but the pages inside were remarkably well-preserved. See, Charles asked. Robert, John, and Emily leaned toward the page. They couldn't make sense of it. It looks like some kind of puzzle, Robert suggested. And you, smart, glared at him from behind the glass of his glasses. Charles, would you like to go to history school? No, thanks for that, Robert smiled. There are only two things I like about history, adventure books and movies like that. So, have another look here. It's really interesting, Charles said to his guests. And finally, he explained himself. He also opened one of the books that John had given him and said that similar information in it directly confirmed the truth of some facts in the book that Charles himself had owned and the accuracy of the information he had doubted until today. It turned out that the page really depicts a puzzle, and the book itself was written in the middle of the 19th century and spoke in it just about those local legends with kippy and gold. However, this scientific work was not widely disseminated for the reason that its author rejected the idea that somewhere in this area could be buried untold treasures. He believed that it was some ancient pagan monument dedicated to some pagan deity. He believed that what could be discovered were antiquities, priceless objects that belonged in museums, but not trivial piles of gold coins. It is believed that it could have been an underground temple and that it could have had hiding places, which were, you know, literally not far from the mole, possibly right in our very forest. And theoretically, having analyzed this puzzle, I had already established the approximate coordinates of the hiding place, and in that book you gave me. It was such a wonderful coincidence. There was a confirmation of that, too. Actually, said John, looking on, with Robert and Emily, we seem to know what you're talking about. We seem to have found one such hiding place, Robert added emotionally, and he swung his hand so hard that he almost knocked the cup to the floor. Are you serious? Charles looked at them incredulously. The little group had to tell the whole truth about their night adventure. Charles listened to them, nodding attentively and stroking his beard. And at the part where they met, Seder laughed heartily. Well, young men, he shook his head. I think I need to see it all with my own eyes. And right away. No, Emily protested. 
We'll get lost again, won't we? Absolutely not, Charles smiled. I know these woods inside and out. I grew up here, and I know the place you told me about too. We used to play there often as kids, but who would have thought that underneath one of those rocks could be such a secret? It turns out my hunch was right. Let's go. Let's find out tonight. Let's not take Mars with us anymore, said Robert. He might get off his leash this time and get lost in the woods. Can we leave your dog here? Charles suggested. They are with Fifa and get along well. Trusting Charles not to get lost and to return even before the sun sets, you set off. Emily had thoughtfully and generously poured bug spray on herself this time. The clearing with the stones seemed less mystical in the daylight, and the rocks themselves seemed smaller. Be careful, please, John asked. He noticed the vigor with which Charles intended to climb down. Oh, young man, when I was your age, I spent all my free time hiking. And such experience, you know, is not forgotten, Charles answered cheerfully. And then, much to the surprise of those present, he skillfully fixed the rope on the trunk of the nearest stone circle. The tree threw it down, then sent the bag with some intercepting tools down there, and finally climbed down himself. For a while there was only some rustling from below. This is incredible, Charles exclaimed. You've got to see it. I'm not going down. Emily said firmly. And then, if the three of you are down there, it'll get stuck, and someone will have to go and get help. John and Robert called her a coward. Hay waved goodbye, and with an enthusiastic anticipation that there really Charles had discovered something extraordinary, they went down. And they were not mistaken. Charles had removed some of the earth from one of the walls of the pit, and behind it was revealed something near a door. It had been built, of course, a long time ago. It was made of intricately woven wood and metal parts, and naturally, over time, the former had molded out of the mold altogether, and the latter had practically crumbled at the slightest touch. So the door, when Charles pushed it forward, didn't just fall off, but rather collapsed. Behind the door revealed a low one. It had to be bent hard. The corridor looks like it turns off from the steps in about 20 paces to somewhere sideways. Aren't we going to fall in here? John asked apprehensively. It shouldn't, Charles replied. You see, you can see some rocks in the ground here. It looks as if the slabs were used to reinforce the corridor. They were built to last. Where are we going? The light of the flashlight was lost somewhere far ahead. We passed one turn, then another. John estimated that, judging by the length of the corridor, this strange underground building went far beyond the glade. The bronze and ceiling and tree roots spoke of it in places. It smelled of dampness, of earth, and the farther they traveled, the more uncomfortable John felt. The thought that there might be a cave in still lingered in his mind. Suddenly, a new turn ended in a wide passage into what could be called an entire underground hall. It was at least a meter wide, and about the same length. The ceiling here was supported by roughly scribed stone columns. John and Robert couldn't help but sigh in admiration when they saw that there were still piles of pottery, both unpainted and multicolored. There were piles of them, some whole, others damaged. There were also some ancient metal items stacked here, and among them glittered a few silver coins. In the center of the room stood a stone sculpture, and at once one could realize that it was not made of ordinary stone, but of something that the guys by their not the most complete knowledge defined as black marble. This statue depicted a horse standing up on its hind legs, and how marvelously it was done. Even in the meager light of the flashlights, one could distinguish the waves, mane, and tail, the emotional expression of the muzzle. And the most amazing thing about this sculpture was that in addition to its hind legs, the horse also had a mermaid tail, and on its flanks and chest, one could see bone carvings that imitated scales. Charles confusedly and enthusiastically explained that this was direct evidence that similar myths and legends could be found in different parts of the world. And so it turned out that in these parts of the world they had believed long ago in the same kind of water horses that were mentioned in the fairy tales of Scotland. Well, young people, 
said Charles with a sigh, congratulations. You and I are now discoverers of something incredible. What about that mountain of shards? Did you find it? Emily asked skeptically and even snidely when they got to the top. You won't believe it when you see it, Robert said, handing Emily a smartphone that captured the underground finds. Charles insisted that when they returned to the village, his companions should not say a word about anything to anyone. He was seriously concerned that a crowd of curious, if not eager, antiquity seekers might interfere with the normal exploration of the site, as well as with the preservation of all the finds. And only later, when real historians and archaeologists came to Smoradina, everything and everyone became known to everyone. Well, why didn't you say anything? Kevin was indignantly offended. You could have told me. It's thanks to me. In fact, all this good stuff was found. Well, there was a book about it, John objected. So I'm not involved at all. The tractor driver landed. Oh, city folk, don't be sad. It's a man. Robert patted him on the shoulder. Charles says he's going to write a book about all these finds, and he's gonna devote a couple pages to your adventures. Wow, that's cool. Got it, Kevin, how edifying and an example of what you can get into if you chase the gold of legends. Robert added with a chuckle. And the tractor driver went quiet again. All right, let him have it his way. He's telling the whole truth. After a little thought, he waved his hand. I just remembered. While I was walking to the clearing, I met wolves. A whole pack of them. I had to fight them. We should make sure Charles writes about that too. John. Robert and Emily looked at each other. For some reason it seemed to them that Kevin had made up the wolves right away and had decided to lie so that Charles could portray him more solidly in the book. Like the brave ones, summer, meanwhile, was coming to an end. The village vacation with all its adventures had flown by like a day. It was time to go back to town. John, although it was a pity to do it, but still sold the house and wished the buyer from the bottom of his heart. And it was the father of a large family and a happy life in it. John also noticed a change in the behavior of his friends between Robert and Emily. Although they might have seemed like complete opposites, there was definitely a relationship developing. They argued with each other less and less and even had the occasional nice conversation. However, if he forced them to do so, they immediately drifted apart. It was as if the attention to their own personalities found them together. They were somehow embarrassed by it. Also, quite unexpectedly, the village had decided to keep Mars. The dog was always trotting towards Argafi, and John decided that since the Spaniel had a love affair, why disturb it? Especially since Charles was not against having two dogs living with him. He said he would take good care of them, feed them heartily for preventive care, take them to the vet sometimes. It was a wonderful summer, Robert said as we drove back. But I won't go to the country again, Emily sighed. I won't go next year either, Robert smiled. But I want to go to Mexico. Explore abandoned towns. Are you coming with me? No way in hell. Poked Emily. Do you know how dangerous it is in Mexico? John was driving. He smiled. For some reason, he thought the two of them would make a great couple. But what about his own personal life? He thought that one day he too would meet a wonderful girl with whom he would be happy.